The Book of Enoch, a recently discovered text which has captured the attention of Christians across the world. Amazing details excluded from the Bible are now supposedly being revealed through this recently discovered book. Fallen angels going against the commandment of God who came down to earth and interbred with human women. And what was the offspring of this unholy union? The Nephilim, giants who grew to heights of over 450 feet tall. And that's not it. New archangels not once mentioned in the Bible. New revelations concerning heaven. The tree of life. And the millennial reign of Christ. And that's just the beginning. Could it be that this book is the missing link we Christians have been waiting for? Today, we'll be opening the pages of the Bible, comparing it to the book of Enoch, to see how they line up. Who exactly were the sons of God? How exactly tall were these giants? Can the Book of Enoch be trusted? One of the most popular doctrines within Christianity today is that before the flood, angels came down from heaven and intermarried with human women. Instead of producing normal-sized children, they gave birth to enormous giant offspring, known as the Nephilim. The portion of scripture this belief is based off is found in Genesis 6. Genesis 6 verses 1 and 2 say, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. This doctrine teaches that the sons of God spoken of in these verses are fallen angels, who came down from heaven and married human women against the wishes of God. Many advocates of this doctrine will cite the book of Enoch in order to support this belief. The book of Enoch says in chapter 69, The name of the first Jaquan, that is, the one who led astray all the sons of God, and brought them down to the earth, and led them astray through the daughters of men. And the second was named Absbeel. He imparted to the holy sons of God evil counsel, and led them astray, so that they defiled their bodies with the daughters of men. So according to the book of Enoch, the sons of God are angels who defile themselves with human women. This teaching can be proved incorrect using several different Bible verses. First, let's start with the fact that angels do not get married. In the New Testament, certain religious rulers, known as the Sadducees, come to Jesus and are asking this question, If a woman has multiple husbands in this life, then whose husband will she be in the next? Jesus responds by explaining that we, as Christians, do not have husbands and wives in the next life. We are as the angels in heaven. Jesus says in Matthew 22, verse 30, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. According to this verse, angels do not get married. The reason it is important to understand that angels do not get married is because in Genesis chapter 6, these supposed fallen angels don't just fornicate with the human women 
they marry them. Genesis 6 verse 2 says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. This means that the sons of God cannot be angels because angels do not get married. Not only that, but according to this doctrine, these angels are supposed to be fallen angels, that is, demonic angels, angels which have rebelled against the commandment of God and are now committing this atrocity. But notice, the Bible does not say that these angels came and forced these human women. The Bible says they married them. Isn't that rather unusual that these demons, who apparently have little regard for the wishes of God, took the time to engage in the God-ordained ceremony of marriage right before committing their heinous deed. You would think that these demons would have just come and done whatever they wanted. The Bible tells us what angels actually are. They are spirits who God sends to aid Christians in their time of need. Hebrews 1 verse 13 through 14 says, But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? According to these verses, angels are ministering spirits who God sends to minister to Christians when they need help. And if angels are spirits, that means that they could never lie with human women because spirits do not have flesh and bone. In the New Testament, Jesus, after his resurrection, shows himself to his disciples by suddenly appearing in the room they are in. His disciples initially are terrified because they think that Jesus is a spirit. In order to convince his disciples that he is not a spirit, he challenges them to try and touch him. If they are able to touch him, that will prove that he is not a spirit, because, as he explains, spirits don't have flesh and bone. Jesus says in Luke 24, verse 39, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. This is important because, according to the Bible, angels are spirits. And if spirits do not have flesh and bone, that means it would be impossible for an angel to lie with a human because you need to have flesh and bone in order to be intimate with another person. Trying to be intimate with an angel would be like trying to be intimate with a cloud. It's just not possible. Not only that, but this doctrine says that when the angels lay with the human woman, they gave birth to fleshly creatures, the Nephilim. But the Bible says flesh can only give birth to fleshly things, and spirit can only give birth to spiritual things. John 3 verse 6 says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. According to this verse, things that are flesh give birth to flesh, and things that are spirit give birth to spirit. So the idea of a spirit producing a fleshly creature is out of the question. If we take a closer look at this portion of scripture, it will become clear that this is human men recreating with human women. Genesis 6 verse 1 says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. Notice that the Bible is deliberate to tell us that these verses are about men multiplying upon the face of the earth, not angels. The Bible repeats this fact in verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years. Notice that after the sons of God lie with the daughters of men, God says that his spirit will not always strive with man. God does not say that his spirit will not always strive with angels because the angels are not involved in this particular story. And lastly, God expresses his frustration with man a third time. Genesis 6 verses 5 and 6 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. It is clear that the problem here is man. 
If this story was about angels coming down to earth and marrying humans, God's primary frustration would have been with the angels. But there isn't a single mention of angels within this entire chapter. You may be wondering, if angels aren't mentioned within this chapter, then where did this strange doctrine come from? This teaching comes from the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch says that the angels are the sons of God, not the Bible. The Bible, however, specifically tells us that God has never called any of the angels his son at any time. In the book of Hebrews, the author is trying to explain to its audience how much greater Jesus is than any of the angels. One of the explanations the author gives is that God called Jesus his son, but God never called any of the angels his son. Hebrews 1 verse 5 says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. This verse is asking a rhetorical question, and that is, which angel did God ever call his son? The answer is clear. He never called any of them his son at any time. He called Jesus his son. So when the Bible says the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, this means that the Bible cannot be referring to angels because God never called any of the angels his son at any time. It would appear that the book of Enoch is teaching a doctrine that goes directly against the teachings of the Bible. There is one portion of the Bible that is almost always used in order to prove that the sons of God are angels, and that is Job 38 verses 4 through 7. These verses say, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The way these verses are used to support the doctrine that the sons of God are angels is by pointing out that the sons of God shouted for joy when God laid the foundations of the earth, and there were no humans alive when God laid the foundations of the earth. The first thing to point out about this interpretation is that angels did not exist when God laid the foundations of the earth either. God created everything that existed in the earth and in heaven in six days. Genesis 2 verse 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. Notice God created the heavens within the first six days. Not even light existed before then. Genesis 1 verse 3 says, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And we know that angels give off much light. But more important than that, if we take a closer look at these verses in Job, we will discover that the sons of God did not shout for joy when God laid the foundations of the earth. They shouted for joy when God laid the cornerstone thereof. The Bible says, Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Notice that the sons of God shouted when the cornerstone was laid. The next thing we need to answer is what exactly is the cornerstone? The answer is Jesus. Ephesians 2 verse 20 says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. According to this verse, the cornerstone is Jesus. Another verse that supports that Jesus is the cornerstone is 1 Peter 2 verse 6. This verse says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. According to this verse, Christians believe on the chief cornerstone and we know that the one we believe on is Jesus. The next question we need to ask is when was Jesus laid as the cornerstone? 1 Peter 2 verse 7 says, 
Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. According to this verse, Jesus was made the head of the corner after he was rejected of the builders. You may be wondering, who are the builders? In the book of Acts, Peter is addressing the rulers of Israel, the chief priests and scribes. The Bible says in Acts 4, verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Then, look what Peter says to them in verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Peter is calling the religious rulers at Jerusalem the builders. So when the Bible says, the stone which the builders disallowed, this is talking about how the religious authorities at Jerusalem were the primary advocates for Jesus being put to death. And notice that Jesus was laid as the cornerstone after he was disallowed by them. That means he was laid as the cornerstone after he was crucified. And we know that there were plenty of Christians in heaven when Jesus was crucified. Now that we have disproved the theory that the sons of God are angels, the next step is to figure out who exactly are these sons of God. The answer the Bible provides is clear. The sons of God are Christians, people who believe in Jesus. John 1 verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. According to this verse, God has given the people that believe on the name of Jesus power to become the sons of God. This would mean that Christians are the sons of God, not angels. The Bible says in 1 John 3, verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. According to this verse, the Apostle John and the believers that he is writing to are the sons of God. Notice, he does not say that the angels are the sons of God. He continues to write, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Romans 8 verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. According to this verse, if you are led by the Spirit of God, that makes you a son of God. Now, does God give his Spirit to angels or Christians? God gives his Spirit to Christians. Ephesians 1 verse 13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. According to this verse, we receive the Holy Spirit after we get saved. All of these verses point to the same conclusion, that a son of God is someone who gets saved. Now that we understand who the sons of God actually are, we can better understand what is taking place in Genesis 6. In the beginning of the world, Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. Abel was the good son who did what was right, but Cain was the evil son who did what was evil. Consequently, Cain gets jealous and decides to kill his brother Abel. Genesis 4 verse 8 says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel and slew him. According to this verse, Cain killed his brother Abel. And why did Cain kill his brother Abel? Because Cain was evil and Abel was righteous. 1 John 3 verse 12 says, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? 
because his own works were evil and his brothers righteous. Adam and Eve then proceeded to have another son, and his name was Seth. Genesis 4 verse 25 says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. Seth then gives birth to a son of his own, which begins a line of descendants who do believe in God and do call upon the name of the Lord. Genesis 4 verse 26 says, And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. And the Bible says that if you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. Seth's godly genealogy, which includes mighty men of faith, such as Enoch and Noah, is listed in Genesis 5. At the same time, the wicked son, Cain, gives birth to a son, and he begins a line of descendants who do not call upon the name of the Lord. This genealogy is recorded in Genesis 4. What this leaves us with is two separate groups of people, a righteous, God-fearing lineage whose father is Seth, and an unrighteous, non-God-fearing lineage whose father is Cain. So when we arrive in Genesis 6, when the sons of God see the daughters of men, that they were fair, what we have is the descendants of Seth who are saved, seeing the beautiful, unsaved descendants of Cain, lusting after them and marrying them. It's saved men marrying unsaved women. Notice that the result of this union between believers and unbelievers is not that mankind on the whole gets better. Instead, the wicked ways of the heathen corrupt the God-fearing ways of the believers. Genesis 6 verse 5 and 6 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Long story short, God eventually decides to flood the entire world because of how bad things get. The lesson we can learn from this story is not that angels came down from heaven and interbred with humans. The lesson we can learn from this story is that God does not want his people to marry the unsaved heathen. God wants us, as Christians, to marry fellow Christians. This is why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 and 15, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? So the next time we read Genesis 6, we shouldn't picture a bunch of angels marrying humans. We should picture a bunch of Christians marrying unbelievers. Now that we have identified who the sons of God are, the last thing to figure out is why. Why is this doctrine important? Isn't it just a couple of obscure verses in the Old Testament? Why does it matter who these sons of God were? Imagine someone came to you and told you that your parents didn't give birth to you. Imagine they told you that your parents actually gave birth to the kid across the street. How would that make you feel? Sad? Disappointed? Distanced from who you thought were your parents? This is what this false doctrine does to Christians. The truth is that God is our Father, not the angels, and God wants us to recognize him as such. Matthew 6 verse 9 says, After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. According to this verse, when we pray, we are supposed to call God our Father, but we can't do that wholeheartedly if we are under the impression that the angels are the sons of God. Galatians 4 verse 6 says, And because ye are sons, 
God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. God desires to have a relationship with us as sons, a relationship where we feel comfortable calling him Father. This is why this doctrine is worth fighting for. A Christian who gets tricked into believing that the angels are the sons of God has been tricked into believing that his own father is the parent of someone else. In this false belief will become an obstacle to the close-knit relationship which God desires to have with us. So if you're a born-again Christian today, remember that you are one of the sons of God, and that is a great privilege which we should not take for granted. Another teaching which stems from the book of Enoch is that when the angels married the human women, they gave birth to giants. These giants often go by the name Nephilim. According to the book of Enoch, these giants reached heights of up to 300 cubits. The book of Enoch says in chapter 7 verses 12 through 15, whose stature was each 300 cubits. These devoured all which the labor of men produced, until it became impossible to feed them, when they turned themselves against men in order to devour them, and began to injure birds, beasts, reptiles, and fishes, to eat their flesh one after another, and to drink their blood. You may be wondering, how tall is 300 cubits? What is a cubit? A cubit is a foot and a half. That means these giants were 450 feet tall. That's the length of Noah's Ark. Before we investigate the subject of giants in the Bible, let's just take a moment to meditate upon the anatomical impossibility of something that large coming out of a human. Okay, the first thing we need to point out about this doctrine is that giants were not the result of the sons of God marrying the daughters of women. Giants existed before those marriages were made. Genesis 6 verse 4 says, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Notice that the giants are not the product of the sons of God coming in to the daughters of men. The giants were in the earth before that took place. The product of the union between the sons of God and the daughters of men is mighty men of renown. The word renowned, as we know, just means famous. So when the sons of God married the heathen woman, they gave birth to well-known sons. The giants were already there. Not only that, but giants didn't exist just before the flood. They existed after the flood as well. For example, there were giants in the promised land when the Israelites came and took over. Joshua 17 verse 15 says, And Joshua answered them, If thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country, and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. If these giants were 450 feet tall, then how did the nation of Israel ever manage to drive them out of the promised land? The Israelites would have never stood a chance. One of the giants who Israel conquered was named Og, king of Bashan. Deuteronomy 3 verse 11 says, For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. According to this verse, Og, king of Bashan, is one of the remnant of the giants. But not only that, but this verse even tells us the size of his bed. Before we discuss how large his bed is, let's first ask this question. Why does God 
tell us the dimensions of his bed. Isn't that a rather strange detail to include in the Bible? The reason God tells us the dimensions of his bed is because God wants us to understand what he means by the term giants. God wants us to understand just how big these giants are. The Bible says nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth thereof. So this bed is 13 and a half feet long and six feet wide. Now, Og was a king. Do kings sleep in beds too small for them? Of course not. So Og probably had at least a foot or two to stretch out in his bed. This means that Og, king of Bashan, was probably around 10 or 11 feet tall. Another important thing to note is that Og, king of Bashan, was an Amorite. Deuteronomy 4, verses 46 and 47 says, On this side Jordan, in the valley over against Beth Peor, in the land of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt at Heshbon, whom Moses and the children of Israel smote, after they were come forth out of Egypt, and they possessed his land, and the king of Og, king of Bashan, two kings of the Amorites, which were on this side Jordan towards the sunrising. According to this verse, Israel dispossessed two kings of the Amorites of their land, Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan. This is important because one of the verses that people will try to use to support the idea that giants were 450 feet tall is Amos 2.9. This verse says, Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above, and his roots from beneath. People will use this verse to say that the Amorites were literally as tall as cedars. This interpretation is due to an inability to decipher when the Bible is talking literally and when it is talking figuratively. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles 12 verse 8, and of the Gadites there separated themselves unto David into the hold, to the wilderness men of might, and men of war fit for the battle, that could handle shield and buckler, whose faces were like the faces of lions, and were as swift as roes upon the mountains. Now, when the Bible says these soldiers had faces like lions, did their faces literally look like lions? No, they were just very brave, fierce-looking men. In 2 Samuel 22, verse 34, when David says, He maketh my feet like hinds feet, and setteth me upon my high places. Does the Bible mean David's feet were literally like hinds feet? Of course not. It means he had very quick, nimble feet. So when the Bible says the Amorite's height was like the height of cedars, the Bible is trying to explain to us that the Amorites were a very tall group of people. The Amorites could not have been literally as tall as cedars because their king slept in a bed which was 13 feet tall. It would be odd that a nation of giants would make their shortest member their king. Another verse that is often misconstrued to support the idea of 400 foot giants is Numbers 13 verse 33. This verse says, And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. According to this verse, some of the Israelites felt like grasshoppers when they saw the giants, the sons of Anak. Again, the problem here lies within the reader's ability to determine when someone in the Bible is speaking figuratively and when they are speaking literally. The speakers in this particular verse who are Israelites feel like grasshoppers when they see the opposing forces, the sons of Anak. Imagine stepping onto a soccer field and seeing that the other team is much bigger than your team. That is how the Israelites feel. In addition, the Bible tells us the height of another giant as well, and that is Goliath, the enormous Philistine who David killed with a sling and a stone. 1 Samuel 17 verse 4 says, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. 
According to this verse, Goliath was six cubits tall in a span. That means that he was about nine and a half feet tall. The tallest man ever recorded in medical history is Robert Wadlow. He was found to be eight feet and 11 inches tall. This means that Goliath was seven inches taller than Robert Wadlow. So were the giants in the Bible 450 feet tall? No, they were close to around 10 feet tall. That's it. There have been several different arguments made to defend the authenticity of the Book of Enoch. First, it has been pointed out that Enoch was an actual person recorded in the Bible who had a great relationship with the Lord. Genesis 5 verses 22 through 24 says, And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. According to this verse, Enoch was such a godly person that God decided to just take him straight up to heaven. Now that is a fantastic testimony. But does the fact that Enoch was a godly man prove that a book named after him should be accepted as scripture? If I were to write a book called the Book of Abraham, does that mean it should be included in the Bible? Of course not. If God intended on having my book included in the Bible, he would have included it in the Bible. It's the same for the Book of Enoch. Was Enoch a godly man? Of course. But does that mean that a book which claims his authorship should be accepted as divinely inspired? Of course not. The second defense made for the book of Enoch is that the Bible quotes Enoch in the New Testament. Jude 1 verses 14 and 15 says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Notice the verse says Enoch prophesied of these. If he prophesied, that means these words came out of his mouth. This verse in Jude is not quoting the book of Enoch. It is quoting something that Enoch said. And lastly, it has been pointed out that the book of Enoch says that the earth is flat, and the Bible also says that the earth is flat. Therefore, the book of Enoch must be valid. This logic, however, does not pan out. There have been many different religions throughout the history of the world that have believed that the earth is flat. Does that make their religion true? Of course not. They believe the earth is flat because when they walked outside, they could see that the earth is flat. It's the same with the book of Enoch. Just because the book of Enoch has one grain of truth in it does not make the entire book true or divinely inspired. The world is full of books which contain true facts. There are even books which state that the earth is flat. But just because something is true doesn't make it God's word. The truth is that the book of Enoch is filled with strange and bizarre doctrines from the very first page until the last. Angels interbreeding with humans and 400 foot giants is just the beginning. There is an angel named Phanuel who seems to have taken over Jesus' role as the mediator between God and man. The book of Enoch says in chapter 40 verse 9, And the fourth, who is set over the repentance unto hope, of those who inherit eternal life is named Phanuel. According to this verse in the book of Enoch, there is an archangel who is set over the salvation of Christians. But the Bible says that that is one person's job and one person only, and that is Jesus. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. It doesn't take long reading this book to discern that God did not write it, 
Someone else did. And if God didn't write it, then who do you think did? But the danger associated with the book of Enoch goes deeper than just doctrines regarding angels and giants. The book of Enoch poses a danger to the Bible itself. If we, as Christians, begin to accept the book of Enoch as authoritative, what we are saying is that the Bible is not complete. There are missing parts. And if we concede to the possibility that parts are missing from the Bible, then the question becomes, then what else is missing? What other books were supposed to be included? The book of Enoch is just another one of Satan's tools used to place doubt in the Christian's mind as to whether or not the Bible is complete. Revelation 22 verse 18 says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. In this verse, God is warning us against adding words to the Bible. And if you try and add the book of Enoch to the Bible, you're not just adding a few words, you're adding a whole book. The truth is, the Bible contains every single word it's supposed to. It's perfect and complete from the beginning to end. Nothing is missing. And if a book was excluded, it was excluded for a reason. So let's do our best to study to show ourselves approved the right way, and that is by studying the King James Bible itself. And let's leave the fantasy books to someone else. Again, we thank you for watching. We hope this documentary has been a blessing to you. We look forward to seeing you in the next one. God bless.